You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Hello again, everyone. This is Doug Thorpe, and you're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense. We've got a great topic today that I think is uh, going to be an interesting one. You know, I work with a lot of clients, and I read a lot of business studies and journals and articles and things, and we've had a lot of, well, we've, frankly, we've been inundated with this thing on emotional intelligence, and a lot of people are doing good work in that field, so no disrespect to them. But there's a new one out there that I was just introduced to, and maybe you've heard about it before, but I had not, and my guest is an expert in this field. It's called the Genius Quotient, and her name is Catherine Matiski, and uh, she is going to help us understand this and know more about it. So, Catherine, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, you might detect a little bit of an accent, and you're calling from which part of the world? I'm in Melbourne, in Australia. Melbourne, Australia. Yeah, well, thank you for <clears throat> hopping online with us. So, so Catherine, I, I kind of want to dive right in and uh, help me understand the, the kind of the theme of the work you do, helping people tap into their own genius. Where does that come from? Well, it really comes from a belief that I have, that I've always had, that everybody inside them has a genius in something. And that might be in the work that they're doing, or it might be in the way they're raising their children, or it might be in some other interest that they have. They might be, they might show that in a genius in woodwork, in cooking, in whatever. But that genius is inside everyone. And I think if you can tap into that, and especially when it comes to in business and for career, if you can find what really makes you tick, then you can say, well, that's who I am and I don't need to change. And how can I strengthen that? How can I move forward in that space? Because that's where I'm a genius. I cannot disagree with you whatsoever. I, th I think that's a, a critical step for all of us to entertain and, and really get a, a grip on those kinds of attributes. What uh, got you into this work? How did, how did you, what does what your background look like getting to this part of life? So I've grown up in learning and development and I grew up originally in the beginning of the computer era in, in um, when PCs were first developed and and I was a computer trainer and I was the trainer that um, people would have had when they did Microsoft Word courses or Microsoft Excel courses or PowerPoint. That was me up the front of the room. And I quickly realized that even in those days, there was people that just gravitated to it and got it and they couldn't get enough of it. And they were like sponges when I was training them on either basic or very advanced functionality of this entirely new world. So there was no precedent for that learning. It's not like Excel had been around before that. You know, certainly there was other products out there, but before the PC era, there was no thing that anyone could um, build their knowledge on. And so this was a whole new era for people. And there was also people that came into my training room completely, in some cases, frightened of this thing's going to blow up in front of them. Or what happens if they if they put the wrong command in or they click on the wrong thing, what could happen? And so there was that if that spectrum. And, and the thing that really sparked my interest then and, and still, still keeps me going some 30 years later is the notion that as a learning professional, my aim is to get 100% of the people in my training to 100% of what we're there to learn 100% of the time. And that one question of how do I do that really propelled me through my entire career. Now, it's been a long time since I've done computer training, and now I help very large organisations in, in Europe and in uh, the US in their learning and development strategies and how to get 
their very big organisations into learning organisations and how to make that learning better for people. And it's still the same question. How do we get people learning at speed where they're taking in information and retaining it? So my whole corporate career has been in that area. And then I said, well, hang on. This is not just the realm of big corporates. This is not just for people who have a corporate job. What about people who don't have a corporate job? What about other people? What about students? What about the local sports coach who's trying to propel their team into the next game? What about them? So that's why I created Inner Genius, because that is everything I've learned repackaged into a package for everybody. Nice. Uh, you know, I, there are several thoughts going through my mind and <clears throat> I don't want to digress, but I, I want to reflect on your your very first statement, your time at the front of the classroom and the PC learning. And I'm old enough. I remember those days. I mean, there might be some people listening that go, what is she talking about? What but, is she talking about? <laughs> but um, yeah, once upon a time, folks, we had uh, we were rolling out desktop PCs at business and we had to teach people how to use them. And uh it was being done at work, and I, I do recall some of the big box stores would have classes for people that wanted to buy one and take it home, and you would go to a class to learn how to plug it all together and move a mouse and do all that. So quick quick side story I can't resist. I was working, and this was when I was in my banking days, and we were rolling out those desktop PCs, and we had a big class of people, and there was a lady in my department that was up near the front of the room and and another lady went through the basic the first like hour and she was trying to she couldn't get the mouse to do what you know she needed it to do and she was frustrated and she threw up her hands and she said this is a sexist initiative she said this mouse thing was designed by a man women don't have that same hand eye coordination we can't do Whoa. this and the lady from my department, who was a little bit outspoken, I'm saying this mildly, but um, she she turned around at this other woman and she said, I'm going to call BS on that. She said, I watched you drive in the parking lot, putting on your mascara, looking in the rearview mirror, driving your car. Don't tell me you don't have hand-eye coordination. <laughs> well, I, said, I heard all those stories and more of people's real reluctance around that entire learning and it's really no different now there hasn't been anything that's come out that's been so universal that everybody had to no. get trained on but you still see it today you know you see it in leadership training where people are hesitant to go they think oh my goodness am I going to be showing up am I going to actually do this well systems training all sorts of things so there's still that same reluctance of learning but it's it's now funny to look back on those days. Absolutely, it is. But but that actually is a segue to my next question. And being a, a lifelong training and development person, I, I know there are huge volumes of work about adult learning and the challenges mm -hmm. trying to take a topic and present it to a so-called adult learner. Uh, could you, without trying to get too far off into that realm, but I think it'll level set a little bit. What are some of the classic challenges that any of us who are trying to help our adult clients learn new things, what are some of the, I guess, roadblocks, hurdles, challenges, tripping points, etc.? I think the biggest challenge right now is when we look at how training is delivered across the board, it's generally delivered by subject matter experts now. Whereas once upon a time, you didn't necessarily need to be a subject matter expert. There was a big function in organisations of learning and development, and then those people would actually um, do the training. But now we're being called on as managers, as peers, in people that have never had a background in learning and development are expected to do training. And that's absolutely fine. That's how it is now in this era. But what happens, the biggest trap, is that there's only a couple of things that um, are the big barriers. The first barrier is that 
the the trainer who's the subject matter expert is full of information and full of detail and wants to kind of spew that detail at people and i read an interesting article um just on my google feed last night about people on zoom calls when they're doing training or learning and how they get set up for zero interaction only to say thank you at the end so what's happening there on the other side of that is the presenter or the trainer, and I lose use that term very loosely, training, because they're not really doing training at all, but the presenter is just doing a, a, a blah, and there's not even a technical word for it, of probably 50 PowerPoint slides. Yeah. And everyone's sitting there <clears throat> passively. And and it was, and this, this person did the survey of what are you doing during those calls? Well, most people are on YouTube or they're doing um, their emails or they're doing other project work or they're just sitting there, you know, watching passively. So that's the first trap is that there's zero interaction and you're just presenting at people. So that's not, there's no learning in that at all. The second trap is that we all learn differently. And so I devised 12 archetypes to describe how you best take in and process information because that profile has never been available. Of all the adult learning research, and at the end of the day, I'm a learning scientist. I study how adults learn. That's what I do. And there's been no profile, and it's annoyed the heck out of me to say how do people, to answer the question, how do people learn? And so how do they learn and how do they process information? So that's why I did the profile of the genius quotient, because it annoyed me that it wasn't there. And so... So what happens is that when you take that profile, you realise that you're one of 12 archetypes, and I've called them archetypes and given them symbols and Spotify playlists and Alexa and all the rest of it, and, and you're one of 12. So if you are teaching and presenting in your natural way, you're not teaching and presenting to everybody. You're teaching and presenting to people who learn a little bit like you which is one twelfth of the solution. And so the biggest trick is to balance your communication, to balance your presentation, to balance your training session so that it's not just for people who are like you, but it's for all 12 archetypes. So then the next question, of course, is how do you do that? So I've created a tool that you get with your profile on how to do that. So mm -hmm. that's my biggest uh, um, bugbear really is that people just communicate very naturally it's a mirror to how they learn so they use language that works for them but they're only really hooking in people that are just like them let me ask you this i i just did an interview last week with a young man who is i guess i'll say somewhat similar in in terms of the learning space anyway and the gist of what we were talking about, he said, for those who have ever had what feels like, and, and I'll use a harsh word, learning disability, you, you, there's, there's just a thing or an aspect of consuming some information that you just can't get, you're blocked. He said the core of it was the fact that our brain needs to be curious in order to activate the, the learning centers and and have those engage in whatever's going on around us and he was he, he was a big advocate of that idea of you, you know you need to focus on this curiosity as a starting point so any i don't want to get into a debate or discussion one or the other but any corollaries there that you can think of well curiosity comes from that point of interest and that's what I would refer to as a hook so what is going to hook somebody in and what makes people curious is the desire to know more so if you break that back down like get underneath that you say well why would I want to know more well it's because there's a gap there so you, you want to look for your now peak that your peak your attention your attention on something and then what happens next is the interesting part because now you have someone's attention 
Now you want them to then go into a learning space, take that information and, re and retain it, and that's retention. So that aspect of curiosity sparks a motivation for learning. Now, when, when you're on, it, as a learner, you sometimes have no desire to learn something. It might right. be a, a right. new standard operating procedure or a new whatever at, in a work instance, or you may be a student and be in, in a maths class, but you have zero interest in it. It's about finding that's a, that that's spark. A local, that's a local joke here in my house, the math class. Is it? Thing. Yeah. So, so it's, it's about finding that spark. Now, one could say that anyone could find a spark in anything. Well, maybe that's true or maybe that's not. But if we take something incredibly classically dull, and, and this is no disrespect to people who write standard operating procedures, but most of us would say that being the recipient of an SOP is probably fairly dull, yet necessary. So then how do we make that spark, to the other gentleman's point, how do we get that curiosity in people? And that's about finding a connection with it. And so when we know how we best operate, and that's your inner genius, your genius quotient, finding that spark is actually easy. So if you're someone who has to connect with it, then you'll look at that SOP and say, how does that relate to me? How does that relate in, in my world? How do I, what's it solving for me? How does that illustrate um, the solution to me? And tell me a story about when that SOP is in place. And somebody else might say, I care less about that stuff. Just give me the detail. I'm going to go through that SOP in detail. Give me the list of step-by-step -step instructions and I'll be right. And other people say, I couldn't care less about those two things. They just want to say, okay, how does this change my process of how I'm working right now? And other people might say, I don't care about any of that, but I've just found holes in that SOP. And the poor person that's <laughs> writing that SOP or worse, delivering it out to the organisation says, how on earth am I going to meet everybody's needs? But And that's where that balanced approach comes in. But for the for the people taking that in, that piece of information, it could be an SOP, it could be anything, for the people taking that in, it is about finding the hook, the hook to hook into that new information in your own way. And we have our own personal choice of that. And once I know that, I go, forget about all the rest of it. I just want to go in for what I care about most. So what what's coming to my mind, and, and pardon me if I'm making this too simple, but what's coming to my mind, if I own a small business and I've got, say, 10 people on my team mm -hmm. in fairly short order of time, I'm probably going to be able to figure out what lights people's lights and, you know, who mm -hmm. who's archetype A, B, C, and D, and, and therefore I can, I can, effectively adjust my ongoing effort with them if I need to teach them new new material and 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 by the way for the record I'm I'm a big advocate of leader as a coach you know you have to be able to stand up and coach the people on your team not just direct but my question is in in larger organizations where there's a much higher velocity of turnover and movement and reorganization and change going on what what's a leader to do as that leader coach in in trying to maintain that awareness and that flexibility of being effective with everybody on their team mm, well we have a team map and so what you would do as a leader is firstly do the profile with your entire team um, and it can be part of the onboarding process. For example, when somebody joins the company, they could do their profile and then as an individual team leader, manager, um, they then have their team map. And Inner Genius is not a personality profile. It is, it is not that. It is a communication profile based on learning science. So how to best, how to keep people in there, what I refer to as a genius zone. So when you've got, a, say you gave that example of 10 people on a team, 
you would put the 10 people on your team map and you would work out who's who. Inner Genius doesn't, the profile that I've created does not expect you, an individual, to change in any way. And other personality profiles do. This doesn't. It says, where is your genius zone? And as a leader then, I look at my 10 people and say, the best way to operate with those 10 people is to keep them in their genius zone. I'll give you an example. One of my team is completely the opposite to me. And at times, we laugh that we drive each other mad because she is, you couldn't get further away from our profiles than each other. For me, I'm the pro, the archetype of the futurist. So I'm all about the vision. I'm all about dreaming up new ideas, creating new um, products, uh, creating new value for our organisation, et cetera, et cetera. She's the opposite. She is the scribe and she is so detailed. We were only laughing yesterday at a team meeting and I said to her, you don't even love the weeds. I said, you're inside the weeds with the microscope, like looking at the atomic structure of the weeds. And she said, I love it there. Well, that is my idea of a really bad day. And yet I need her on my team. When I move her out of her genius zone, which is all about detail, structure, logic, very um, uh, procedural, factual, practical, efficient stuff, that's her genius zone. If I ask her to move out of that, what happens is timelines just blow out. She's not happy. If I ask her to do the big picture stuff, if I ask her to get really insightful about things, that's not her. She's all about that detail. And if I keep her in that genius zone, like on a project, where there's a group of my team members working on a project, we all know where we operate best. And when we are all working in our singular genius zones, then what happens is the synergy of that is unstoppable, where one plus one plus one plus one equals greater than four, because everybody is bringing their best self to the project. Projects work faster, they're more efficient, there's friction, it just goes out the window, it's frictionless. It's so easy if we keep people in their genius zone. And for myself, if I go to a project meeting and they dive me into the detail, I can stay there for a while and I say, right, I'm happy to go into the detail with you, but I've timed myself. And my time of when I start to get an emotional reaction is 43 minutes. You got at a shelf 43 life. <laughs> minutes, yeah, at 43 minutes, I start to get really emotional and go, I've got to get out of here. I can't handle it. So I can do the detail, but it's not my genius zone. Keep me in my genius zone. And that's, that's the same for any leader. You don't want to hire people like you. You've already got one of you. You don't need another one. You hire people who are different to you and get them into their genius zone, and then the collective of that balance comes forward. So that's it's easy to do. And if people know what their archetype is, they say, I can do that task. It's not me, but I'll step up and do it. But I just know that I might need help in that. And you go, fine, yeah, cool. So just curious, and if you take this profile and you're you're designated as one particular archetype does the does the survey elaborate on on like i guess i'll call them wings that are kind of related corollaries in in a, a zone around that kind yeah, of so not quite complementary but accessible or or usable yeah mm, mm. so absolutely and so yes we each have a very distinct archetype where we operate best but it's very easy to drift into archetypes that are quite, kind of close in profile to one's um, uh, one's profile so so for me I'm the futurist 
it's not unusual for me to drift into the energizer or the explorer because we're sort of in the same family if you like so where i don't drift is over to where my colleague is as the scribe i, I don't like going there i can go there but i don't like going there so, so the other thought that comes to mind again as a team leader or owner of a business it, it what i'm thinking about is i would want to administer this survey during the hiring process to use that as a parameter to decide whether or not i well to put it in i think your words if if i don't need another one of those people on my team and i get this candidate that shows up that is just zero deep in that profile maybe i don't want another one of those right now maybe i'm really looking for something else well you have to be very careful around discrimination sure, based on sure. that type of activity what you can do though is ask in you can certainly use this with it within the recruiting process many many um profiles are administered during the recruiting process Sure. And this is one for learning and communication. So that's that's there's nothing wrong with that. What you can do, though, is to ask some really good questions um, to really start to think about the type of person that you want to join the team. And so asking them questions, even around the um, archetype processing powers, which is connect, detail, construct and invent, asking questions around that will, and listening to their answers not and not listening to the answers that you think they're giving you but actually listening to the answers that they are giving you will help you to understand what really um, resonates with the candidate and where they best operate and simply asking a question like in your whole life what are you really good at? Not just in work, but in your whole life. And stop and listen to the answer. They mm. might say, I'm really good at getting my community rallied around a charity. And you go, well, that's interesting. And tell me more about that. And so these, these types of questions will give you an insight because everybody knows what they're good at. But people don't get to be asked that question. And where do you operate best? What's the what's the best project you've ever worked on? What did you contribute to that you thought was your best work? And then listen to that. Because if I was answering that, I would say it's when I dreamed up this product here or it's when I invented that or when or whatever. When somebody else on my team answers it, they might say, I led this team and we were so connected together. It felt more like a family. We were in this together and so on. Or someone else might say, I managed to save the company X dollars by executing this plan, by doing this, 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 this. By listening to those answers, you can get an insight into where they operate best. And that's what this is about. It's about keeping people in that genius zone. Just keep them there. They'll be happy. They'll be engaged. They're not going to leave. They won't be a quiet quitter. They will be there for the long term. Very valuable, very solid information. And I tell you what, Catherine, it's time on the clock. We're going to need to take a short commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to dive into more of the elements of learning about how to tap into your genius within. Business is all about solving complex problems as fast as you can create them. Become the best problem solver by leading others to greatness too. And the first step is going to DougThorpe.com. Doug Thorpe is known globally for coaching entrepreneurs and business leaders, improving their performance and the work output of everyone surrounding them. You can find health, wealth, and happiness by learning to lead others to health, wealth, and happiness. Go to DougThorpe.com now and order Doug's books or hire him to coach your managers. That's Doug, T-H-O-R-P-E.com. All right, everyone, we're back. You are listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense. I'm Doug Thorpe, and I'm visiting with Ms. Catherine Matiski. We've been talking about a thing called the genius quotient, and 
I want to wrap up a little bit, Catherine, in terms of the employer employee employers trying to tap into that inner genius among their teammates and really being good about doing that. Uh, while we were on the break, I was describing a scenario that I think a lot of small businesses may be wrestling with right now. In, in the face of the unknown economic circumstance in the world right now, a lot of small businesses are sort of, as we say in my part of the world, hunkering down to um, uh, weather the storm that may be coming. And what that means is they're asking teams to do more or individuals on teams to do more of different things. And in a lot of cases, that doesn't always work out real well. So I think the obvious answer, Catherine, if I, if I got the learning right from the first half, is I need to do better as a leader of matching up my people's genius zones with the things I think I need to spread around. Is there anything else I can do besides that? I think the other thing to do as well as that, that's certainly a, a first step as well as that is let them sort themselves out. Once there's this open communication around people's archetype and we have, for example, we use Slack, and so next to everybody's name on their Slack channel is their archetype symbol. So it's very obvious. Mm. And in people's um, signatories on their email is their archetype badge. So we're very open and visible, not only to each other, but also to the outside world of our archetype. And so that says to the world, this is how I best show up and how I best work. And what I did with my team that may be useful for other leaders is to say, here is the project, here is the project window, and here is the goal. I want you to work out how that would best workflow between you, all using, coming to the table in your individual genius zones so that we can get this delivered. And what I found was, firstly, for myself, that was a major departure on the way I lead. I would either work it out and distribute the work or classically I would meet with the team and go, okay, what do you think? Let's work together. And I'm in the circle in the meeting with them working it out. So for me to step out of that was quite a departure of how I like to collaborate or not. And so when I did that, they came up with, different workflows and different systems than I could have ever imagined. And I thought it was really interesting because I also then noticed that because they had said, I'll do this part, I'll do that part, they broke it down into a lot more steps than I would have and each taking their parts and I'll work with you on this and then I'll work with you on that, I'll work independently on that piece and we'll come together here and there and whatever. They worked out the workflow they also had a higher level of accountability because they had said, I'll do that part. So then, then it's the Robert Cialdini commitment and um, uh, consistency influence pattern. So they were, they were more likely to be committed to it because they had said it out loud. And that's, if you haven't read that book, read that book on, on influence. And they owned it. And projects got delivered on time or before time. So as a leader, I'm happy. So I think the other piece of it is that being visible about people's genius zone, and we laugh about it. We laugh that some people are off the charts detail. We laugh that some people are off the charts in the way they get things done. We laugh about things that are off the charts brainstorming and so on. We just laugh about it because we go, this is me, this is who I am, this is what I bring to the table and it's okay. Nobody's expected to change. So when you hand that responsibility onto the team and say, okay, here's the goal, work it out, everyone get into their genius zones, only do the pieces of the project that are in your genius zone. If there's, got, if there's gaps where there's nobody, well, what are we going to do about that? Find a solution. They often come back with the most amazing workflows that I could have never constructed. So I think it's a good lesson. It was certainly a good lesson for me. Fabulous. You know, you, you dangled a little carrot there as you were describing that. You mentioned the external facing presence of the 
descriptors of who is in what zone. I heard you mention the word, you know, put the badge in the email signature. How does that play out for companies trying to communicate that to their customer base and their potential prospective customers? If we go back to my example about training, where the presenter is up there presenting the way they like to learn and the way they like to communicate as a result of that, I see the same thing in marketing communication that hits my inbox in a tsunami every morning when I open it up. And I can tell people's archetype by how it's written. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of my early morning game. I open up all those emails that I get flooding into my inbox, buy this, buy this, consult with this, do this, do this, do this, which all of which I delete, or well, many I would delete. But a, a, as part of the game, I read those emails and go, oh, valedictorian, oh, narrator, oh, that was written by a decryptor, oh, that was written by the catalyst, oh, that was written by the horologist, that was written by the composer, that was written by the scribe, that was written by the explorer. That's the game I play. So what does that mean, apart from this nerdy learning science game that I play in my head, what that means is that the person writing that marketing comms is writing their way in the way they like to learn and that's a mirror to how you communicate. So they're only hooking in with great um uh, with, with great power, people who learn a bit like them. So what does that mean for the rest? So there's a whole lot of marketing comms and I read it in sales proposals. I read it in websites. I read it in any um, external facing communication. I can take it apart in five minutes and say who wrote it and who's likely to have written it and how do we then change that to be balanced so that if by tweaking sometimes just a few words, it might be five words on an entire page of a website, might take that from hooking in three archetypes or one archetype to 12. That's the, that's the key here is that, but especially if you're in small business, you know, you're trying to be all things to all people. You're doing a website one day, you're doing a Facebook ad the next, you're doing a brochure the next, you're doing a proposal, which is a good day when you're doing a proposal, you're doing all of these things and you're just you. So how do you then say, okay, this is not really working so well, or if it is, how could I make it work a whole lot better? And it comes down to the words on the page. That's interesting. And I guess a thought that's coming through my mind, and I'll be a little bit transparent and vulnerable. Um, a few months ago, I got a call one day from somebody who said, uh, Doug, I think I need you to come talk to us about coming to work for us and helping us out. And I said, okay, great. But I also was curious. I said, you know, I've known you guys for a year and a half. Why, why haven't why have this call happened sooner? And he said, I was listening to some of your podcasts. I was doing some yard work over the weekend, and it just happened a couple of episodes I heard. What you were talking about with your guests got in my brain, and I just knew you you were camped out. You were aligned. You were there. We were clicking, and I, I said, I want some of that. Come on down, you know, and I went, okay, so that's great. So I, I think my point is, I mean, anybody that's followed the show, we, we talk about a lot of different things and we're kind of over a very broad waterfront here in the way we share ideas and the, the various guests I've got. And I think I at this point of coming up on 100 episodes, I'm pretty sure, Catherine, that I've had every one of your archetypes on my show in one form or another. So maybe that's maybe that's part of the byproduct of that. Mm, mm, probably and also maybe that potential client as he was doing his yard work was listening to you or your guest and they were a similar archetype to him because there is that connection between people of the same archetype they're speaking their language it's like speaking French or Spanish or English or 
whatever language it is, yeah. each archetype speaks their own language. And so when when we're talking to people who are speaking the same language as us, we bounce ideas off them, we feel like there's this connection, oh, they're just like me, they get me, but what about the rest? And, and coming back to your small business owner, they need to care about the rest because their clients will come in all shapes, sizes and forms. And so... And they'll also come in all different archetypes as well. And imagine the possibility if you could connect with people who are not like you, who are not using the same language, because that's the idea is that it's a bit like going back to the French, Spanish, English. Imagine if you spoke Spanish as your native language and I spoke French. Well, we could speak all day and neither of us would be any the wiser. Well, wouldn't it be amazing if, if I noticed that you were speaking French and could go, oh, okay, um, he's speaking French. I'll now speak French. Or I meet someone else and they speak German. And I go, oh, they're speaking German. Okay, I'll speak German. So my natural language of Spanish gets part and I translate my own language into German or maybe it's there from Switzerland, so they're Swiss German or whatever it is. And that's the same as translating amongst the archetypes. And, and I have something called an archetype translator tool. So how do you speak, write, or present to someone who's a different archetype to mm, you? Fascinating. And so using their language. I, I would think that would have application on just about any industry I can think of. And I'm... You know, I'm an old banker, and we certainly had customers that were from all walks of life. Uh, I mean, we had, you know, manufacturing companies, we had retailers, we had construction companies, uh, you know, just you name it. We, we had them at the bank, and coming in, obviously, they would be speaking in the language of their industry. And as I think about it now, in, in the case of, of the, I'll go so far as to say, the better performing company owners, they were clearly operating in their genius zone mm. with what they chose to do with their business. And you're right. If, if we weren't adapting well and our bank, one of our distinguishing marks was that we were pledged to learn your business. We weren't going to teach you what a bank does. We were going to mm -hmm. come learn your business and we would advise on what we could provide as a banking service to help you. And, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't nearly as articulately spelled out as you've done it, but, and we didn't have a framework of which language to pick, so to speak, but, um, we were definitely encouraged to be very good listeners and consultative in nature as opposed to directive in nature. Mm -hmm. And that listening piece is really key to that. So when we when we look at communication, you know, I think there's so many people who, well, we've never, firstly, we're never really taught to listen, um, but so many people who aren't really listening, they're just constructing the next sentence to say to fill the next void of silence right. or they're um, thinking of an answer or they're thinking of something completely different or they're being thinking in a very judgmental way about what they're hearing. And the first trick of this is to really um, focus in and listen on the words people are using. Not the words you think they're using, but the actual words that they're using. And if you can do that, it's a skill. It's a whole new skill. But if you can do that, you can learn to spot people's archetype without that person doing the profile. Now, if you think about that in a small business situation, that imagine you're sitting with a potential customer and they're speaking in the way that they learn and, and that's mirrored in their communication and that you can tap into that, then you can speak back to them in their way. And that's the ultimate in, you know, um, empathy and respect and customer service is to really get in that in that old saying, get in the shoes of the customer. That's what this is really about. And, and, and it's not just customers. It's um, parents who are having difficulty with their teenagers, um, for example, 
and um and, and I had three of them. And so I know what teenagers on the couch looks like and how do you get them off the couch? Yeah. And it's it's sports coaches and it's teachers and it's it's ever how do you actually get people to number one pay attention and number two how do you resonate with them to connect with them and then communicate with them to ultimately influence them to do something to take action and that's what this is about. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, hmm, what you said there makes me think is there a is there an age at which this archetype really starts to take shape and and get uh, become a, a an obvious uh, aspect of someone's presence um we've just actually this you must be a little bit of a mind reader because we just had a meeting this morning and um the head of our um, inner genius faculty is um, looking at the uh, asking the question: At what point is this formed? And so it's probably going to spin off a bigger um, study. But the the what we know right now is that children, as soon as they can do the profile, we can determine their archetype. So, and I think, in my opinion. That's probably around 12 to 13 years old. Now, it was, I had a very interesting conversation with someone who runs a preschool system, and it's like a, um, a three to five year old child. And he, he did the profile, and he said, and he has um, a, a care system where the reporting on what the child is doing all day during um, kindergarten and reporting that back to the parents. And he said he can see the archetypes in children very young. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but certainly I know that it is formed and probably doesn't change throughout your entire life. Uh, we know that from learning science, but to answer your question specifically, there would need to be a further study on that because I don't, I don't think a study. I'm just curious, right some folks that I know that I don't know what their archetype would be, but they would be interested in knowing that because when I administer personality profiles, that's often a discussion I get, but it only happens probably about one out of 12 people has that question. So I'm guessing that's an archetype somewhere in there. Well, this so inner genius is not a personality profile. It's a communication profile, which is a bit different because many personality profiles expect you to change. They expect you to have some um, bridging effect that you can change and flex, whereas this doesn't. It says you are who you are, work in your genius zone, and life is pretty sweet. Right. Right. probably the, the the unscientific version of it. So so the idea with the genius quotient is to really maximise your strengths and what you bring to the table and as a leader to really get your team working in their genius zone and as a business owner to look at the outside possibilities to say, well, can we be communicating in a more balanced way as we go to market, as we do our marketing, as we go through our sales process? How are our sales people selling? Are they selling to people that are just like them or are they selling to people who are all 12 archetypes? Yeah. i tell you what, Catherine, we're about up on time here today. We've alluded to it several times. How does someone get a hold of you if they're interested in diving in and having this uh, profile administered? So the first step is um, there's the website, which is thegeniusquotient.com. So thegeniusquotient.com. If you can't find it, you can find me on LinkedIn. Send me a message on LinkedIn or all the links are there. Um, and if you are a business owner or you're listening to the this podcast and you want to know more, send me a message on LinkedIn and say, hey, Catherine, do you want to meet for a coffee? I will say yes because that's what I do, and I'll help you out. So we'll book a time on Zoom. We'll have a virtual coffee. It's going to be a great chat for me, and if I can help people, then I'm more than happy to. That's great. 
Well, we will have those links in the show notes, folks. And by the way, I always like to remind people, if you're listening to this show on your favorite streaming channel, we do have a video version over on YouTube by the channel of the same name, Leadership Powered by Common Sense. And Catherine, uh, one last time, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thanks so much. It's been great. All right, everyone. It's been a pleasure. We're happy you could join us and look forward to seeing you again real soon. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.